Welcome to Marco Rock TV. I'm Marco Rock. I'm a host for Inside a Great Mind. And today on the show, we have Dr. Washington Garcia, our guest. How are you, sir? Uh, hi, Marco. I'm doing well, thank you. And thanks for inviting me to be part of your show. Thank you. So you're the director of music at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. But besides that, you have so many other titles. You're going to help me with those. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite interesting. I've, I've always had a problem with when people ask me, who, who, what do you do? Exactly, right. <laughs> and um, I remember before my, 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 my previous position here in Omaha, I was in Texas for several years, and I was there a professor of piano, assistant director of School of Music, director of the International Piano Festival, director of the Young Artist Piano Competition, and, um, and, and so on. So it's, it's always been a good problem to have. Here in Omaha, I am um, a director and professor also of piano. Also. I also teach here in the School of Music. I'm a professor of piano and I'm the director of the School of Music. So those, I would say, are my, my main professional uh, titles. <laughs> Personally, of course, you know, I, um, well, I'm a full-time dad now, yeah. as of December 7th of last year. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And I do keep a performing career as well. I'm a concert artist. Um, before I came to Omaha, uh, I used to play a lot more, and of course, because of my new uh, full-time responsibilities as director, exactly. I have cut on the number of, of performances that I do. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I mean this actually, it's a good thing because I am in a in a good position now that I'm able to say no when things are not uh, contributing to my mission as, as director. Uh, because at the end of the day, all the performances that I do um, impact in a positive way the work that I'm doing as director. Definitely. So I limit the number of performances I do, but they are really the ones I want to be involved with. That's amazing. So you start your music studies career, well, I would say career studies, when you're like, you know, six, six years old. So is that, is that something that your parents push you to do, or are you just like a gift that you're born with? I think it's a combination of both. I would not say my parents pushed me, but they show me the door. They show me the way, and my family, uh, friends, and my uh, network of support helped me to walk this path. So they show me where to go, uh, they, uh, and they helped me to go through it. Uh, I actually started when I was four. Um, oh, and uh, <laughs> unofficially, because my grandmother helped, me, my grandmother taught me the first few notes on the piano. So she taught me how to play with one finger. And so by the time that I was six, that's when I enrolled at the conservatory. Again, unofficially, because I went to the first day of classes with my sister, just as um, my sister and I were very close. When, when she was going to the conservatory, she was eight, I was six. And um, I grabbed on her, and, I, I, and my parents knew it was going to be a really bad day for her and for me. So they decided to send me to the conservatory alone and said, well, you have to behave well. So I went to the conservatory with her, again, not registered. And at the end of the year, the teacher called my mother and said, you know, we, we need to talk. My mother told us, well, you better tell me if you guys did something wrong. I don't want to be embarrassed in front of the teacher. Um, and then she told my mother, you know, he, you have a really talented, gifted son. Uh, he needs to do this seriously, uh, uh, considering a career in the future. I mean, such a young age, what father or mother, you know, starts thinking about the, the, the career of your son when he's five or six. Uh, but my mother told her, I, I don't have a son here, I have a daughter registered in the conservatory. <laughs> and the teacher <laughs> said, well, isn't, isn't Washington your son? And she said, yeah, but he's really not a student here, he's just come to audit. Yeah. So the teacher said, well, didn't you see all the exams that I sent during the year with happy faces? And, and my mother said, well, not really. I, I thought he was joking. I thought that you really were just giving him these smiley faces for, as, not to make him feel bad because he's a tiny boy. Uh, the teacher said, no, this is actually for real. And uh, so what I would like you to do is to enroll him in the next level of the conservatory, pre-college at the time, um, but he doesn't have to repeat this degree. So what happened is that kept being the rule, so, and they kept skipping me grades because I was apparently somehow uh, talented and, and gifted. So by the time I was 13, I finished every level of the pre-college. I went as far as I could. 13. 13, and then they had to start a program for me, a special program. Uh, so they, I entered the Bachelor of, uh, of Music degree at 13. So you feel like you're like a, a kind of like a, a cool kid, right? <laughs> because they had to have like a special program for I was, I was different and I was, I was the only one in the class, of course, so I had, I had individual classes. I really wasn't, I mean, I took some group classes, but most of the classes I took in order to graduate were almost as independent studies because um, it was a unique case. So by the time I was 18, I, I graduated from the National Conservatory of Music with my Bachelor of Music in Piano Performance. 
And it was a very special moment because I was also very lucky to, and I feel very honored that I, where I was born, I'm very proud of, of my roots, uh, yeah. having Hispanic uh, ascendants. But one of the aspects that was very also helpful to me without expecting it is that it, it, there was competition, but uh, I had more opportunities to shine um, coming from a place where at the time also, you know, classical music did not have as many opportunities as in other parts of Europe or the United States. So what I mean by that is when I graduated from the National Conservatory of Music and I was the only student of this class, uh, I was able to have my, my senior recital with the National Symphony Orchestra performing Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto. And that's not something that is very often uh, the case uh, with an undergraduate student giving a senior concert. So you're from Ecuador mm -hmm. uh, and you were able uh, to be the youngest to graduate from a top-notch university, Job Hunking, when you're 25 with your PhD de degree in music. I think that's very amazing uh, for you you know, to be able like, you know, to rise. So how, how, how did that feel to be the first, you know, Latin American? My life has been like a train, like a fast speed train. From a very early age, I had a very unusual um, childhood in the best possible way. I don't regret anything, but I wasn't part of parties. I didn't party. I didn't have chance to, to do things that other kids my age would do because I, I, I was taking English classes, private piano classes, do college and high school at the same time. And uh, so it was, it, was, it was very, very difficult. And it's, you know, at the time I thought, well, maybe this will change in, in, in the future. And it didn't. It kept go getting better and better in the sense that I got more responsibility. So to answer your question, I haven't had the time to really uh, sit down and think. And process it. And process what's <laughs> happened since I was four <laughs> until now. <laughs> so I don't really think about, uh, strangely, I don't think about um, what it feels like, all, the, all these recognitions or achievements that, 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 that come my way. Um, I try to always focus on everybody's surrounding, on my surroundings, because uh, that's what I'm here for. So among your teachers, your mentors in the music industry, which is the one has impacted you the most and why? There have been several, you know, of course, in the piano world, I have been influenced by my, my, profe my, my, God, my first teacher. I still see her when, when, when she was, when she was, when she, I started at the age of six and she influenced me because when I got to the age of 10 and I was four, she came to my parents and said, I have nothing else to offer him. I've gotten to the point where it's beyond me. I have to pass him to the next person. Had she had a different attitude of, well, he's my student, I have to keep him, he's gonna make me shine, I wouldn't be here with you today. All right, that's so true. That person had that influence on me. You know, on the personal side, I had administrators who inspired me. I had the dean of the Peabody Institute, his name was Steve Baxter. And he passed away a few years ago. And he was like a second father, a mentor to me. And he continued to inspire me in a big way. Um, when I graduated, he, you know, I told him, I have no way of paying you for giving me the scholarship you gave me and for mentoring me throughout these years. And he, he said, yes, there's a way you can pay me. Do the same for somebody else. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's, I have not forgotten those words. And that's, again, part of my mission to inspire others or at least try to inspire others and help others. So again, there is the inspiration from the personal aspect or administrative side as a family. My, my parents inspired me from day one. Um, my father, even now, still lectures me about life and, <laughs> and you course, know, right. <laughs> and my mother the same. But look, when I was 12, 13, my dad, uh, I, I left home at six o'clock in the morning, came back at nine, 10 at night. Those are my days. I came back to do homework and uh, practice sometimes at that time. Sometimes my father would stop the car two blocks from home and, and sit down with me and talk about uh, helping mature. And I remember clearly he telling me, you are gonna have to grow up faster than all of your friends because you're not meant to be here. You're meant to go abroad. You're meant for great things. You will have great responsibilities and you need to be able to grow up faster than anybody else. And at the time, of course, sometimes I would just rebel against it because I thought, well, you know, why is he talking about that's dad talking? Now I, I get it. And I am also 
I feel very fortunate and blessed that I listened to him because I would have chosen not to, and I did. So because of that, uh, I was able to grow up uh, faster. I, from a very early age, my family inspired me and prepared me to have all the skills uh, that I needed to be able not only to survive but to create, to make things happen. Yeah. So you have performed. Uh, overseas, you know, those, you know, you've been to all those countries, China, Switzerland, Italy, performed for former president, performed at the World Bank, at the State Department. I mean, all those kind of stuff. What's next for Dr. Garcia? That's a really good question, Marco. The beauty about the music field is that there is no an end. It's a journey, really. I know it's a cliche, but it's, I've, there are works that I've performed since I was 15, 14, and I still play them, and I don't get bored of them. You know, I, there is always something to learn. It's like falling in love with somebody. You don't really say, well, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm in love and that's as much as I can love this person. There's always growth with my kid. When I knew he was going to be born, I loved him already before he was even born. And then every day that goes by, I keep loving him more and more. And I know that's not going to stop. So with the music feels the same thing. You know, you get to a performance, I've played at Carnegie Hall, and some people could think, well, uh, you know, I've made it, I've got to the top, Carnegie Hall, is it? No. Then you go to another place and it's a different kind of experiences and uh, it keeps getting better and better. As far as performances go, if we're talking about, you know, practically what's coming next in my agenda, I will have my debut with the Omaha Symphony on October the 8th at the Jocelyn Art. I'm really thrilled about this and this is a very special and very emotional uh, time for me being my Omaha debut and I will be performing with Maestro uh, Thomas Wilkins, Mozart's D minor Piano Concerto K466 okay. uh, because I've been holding uh, my performances in Omaha for about a year and a half so <laughs> I, I felt bad that some people asked me, hey, can you play? Can you come and, and, and give a lecture here and there? And I said, Please understand, it's not that I'm arrogant, but I really want to hold that special first performance for a very special moment, and I cannot think of any more special time than playing with Maestro Wilkins and the Omaha Symphony. That will be on October the 8th. Uh, a few days after, I will be heading to the Dominican Republic to play a solo recital at the main Teatro Nacional in Santo Domingo. Um, and then November, uh, we have some, uh, some preparations I have to do for the NASM conference that I go every year as administrator. And in December, after school finishes, I will be heading to China to play also some concerts. So that's what's you left for the rest of the year. You have a business schedule coming and, up, right? And, 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 <laughs> you know, again, my main focus is teaching and, and administration because um, uh, somebody has to, to um, monitor the, the ship. Yes. So I can't be away from my desk for very long. But the times when I am away, where I usually try to do when there is a break or when, when a weekends or when I can you know, afford to be out of the office, they're very special as far as, as, as performances go. As far as School of Music and Administration, that's the best part of it. We just started the renovation and expansion of Strauss, which has been an a, a initiative that has been up in the air for many, many, many years. And finally, it became true. So that project will be finalized in December of, the, of next year. And we'll have a smaller recital hall for our students' performances, chamber performances, op shop, choir. We'll have a new recording studio. We'll have a floor for the percussionists. We'll have more practice rooms, more offices, student lounges, a music archive, an administrative suite. Uh, they will work on, the res on this concert hall, renovating some of the lighting, the, the, the wiring of, of for the technology area, and so on. It's a really exciting time in terms of what's next for the School of Music. And that, uh, what's next, is not just what's next for next year. We're looking at a, at a bright future for the next uh, several years. How can you use music to create a positive change? Marco, music is a very powerful force. Music has the power to change the lives of people. It, it has the power to shape our society. Uh, it unites us and we need to be united. Uh, I, I have been very blessed that ever since day one when I came to the United States back in the 90s, I never felt isolated, I never felt discriminated, I have always was treated in a way that I felt part of this environment. And, and you know, when I came to the university, most of our, my friends were Asian, Korean, Japanese. Uh, some of we couldn't communicate verbally very well <laughs> because uh, the language, the language so, barrier. Yeah. But music is what connected us. So music had that power. Music 
music has a healing power. We are very much looking forward to starting a collaboration with, with the uh, Pamela and Fred Cancer Center here in Omaha. We're moving forward positively on that to get involved with our students, our faculty, and, and the community in general, so that we can bring the healing power of music into the community and those patients who uh, may be at different stages of, of their process uh, you know, in the cancer. Cool. Dr. Garcia, thank you so much for your time. Marco, it's my I pleasure. I hope we'll do this again in the future.